You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and I'm joined by this lovely guy I'm again. stranger. Yeah. How Jared you been, Mouse, boss, man? good. Been a while. It's been a real long time. I'm glad to have you back. Staying busy. You're doing great things, I'm man. doing- you keep pushing out the content. Uh, yeah. Three episodes per week for yeah. five months has been That's insane. Awesome. But it's been, it's been a lot of fun, the people I've gotten to talk mm. to from, like Joe Love. I got, I got to go mm. up there and talk to him about their whole situation. This is now public knowledge, so because I had to sign an NDA. They have the black bass stamp now, which is pretty cool that they just launched, which is awesome. I also got to talk to like Martin Gary of the Potomac Association mm-hmm. there. That was really cool. So we just keep hammering them out. But I mean, you keep bridging gaps too. I think that's what I like between the fishermen, the angler, the professionals, and uh, you're just bridging gaps in the fishing industry. And honestly, getting truth out, I think sometimes it's opinion, but I think a lot of times it's getting the truth out it's not speculation or somebody's opinion it's i hope i'm doing good and not just i think mail, so but we'll see. i maybe, think maybe they're are. both the same yeah, it's a platform like we said it's a platform to to be able to get that information out because sometimes things go unheard too uh, mm-hmm. and so you're you're being very proactive with things and getting the right people on oh and with that said we have the man the myth the legend i've been wanting to get him on on like a yearly basis because he is a rock star in his own right john odenkirk of the department of wildlife resources virginia department of wildlife resources sir thank you so much this has been like a a couple month thing to get you back in but i'm so happy you're here happy to be back so i mean honestly i think we're gonna lead this off and we'll we'll set the table back in january when we were down in richmond um Mm -hmm. you know i was i was approached by the department to come down and talk about their big code red or depth con one which i kind of like for the title there which was the alabama bass situation um and then i saw you i think it was this power i could be wrong this powerpoint presentation you were doing for like northern virginia kayak association um and i was glued to it because i absolutely love this thing and your work so i really just wanted to start off again just kind of telling the audience like they've never heard this before about this situation and we can kind of go from there sure it's a good story in some ways (laughs) bad story in other ways but it's interesting um, so yeah, you just want me to run with it? Yeah, go for on, it. Okay. Got plenty of time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember when the first time might've been the first time I ever heard about Alabama bass was when we had a, what we thought was a state record spot out of Claytor. Uh, and it was bigger than we expected a state record spot to be. Uh, and we had a contract at that point with, I believe Auburn university for some genetic testing, and we went ahead and took a fin clip from that fish and sent it down to Auburn. And it came back as not a pure spot, but it mm. came back as an Alabama mix. And I honestly don't remember what that particular mutt was, how many different uh, genotypes were in there. But that was when we started to say, you know, something might not be all good. And then and this was cool. We're going back quite a few years, five plus. And about that time, within the next year or so, we started to hear some rumors and going to AFS, American Fishery Society talks, and hearing papers from our, our peers in other states talking about their concerns and some of the studies and genetic work that they've been doing that were showing that, amazingly enough, Alabama bass appeared to be getting moved around. Uh, and it appeared the most likely avenue for this was, was anglers. And they were moving them around because well, why do anglers move fish? Um, mm-hmm. so they want to make things better, but they don't know what they're doing. Um, and we just begging people, please don't move fish. If you want to put fish in your own private pond in your backyard, okay, that's one thing. But when you put fish in an open system, you can't take that back ever. It's done. Uh, and, and it may not be a terrible thing, and it might be a terrible thing. Um, And so apparently what was happening was these people were moving fish around for their own selfish purposes and populations were becoming established. And, you know, at first on paper, it's like, okay, maybe this isn't a terrible thing. Uh, But as time went by and more people were looking into this, specifically in the southeastern U.S., Georgia, North Carolina, uh, South Carolina, it became apparent that there were things going on that weren't really good. Um, and part of it related to the propensity of Alabama bass to displace largemouth bass in reservoir situations. And even more troubling than that was the potential for this fish to interbreed with 
co-geners. Um, Mycropterus is the genus of smallmouth, largemouth, spotted bass, Alabama bass. And you have hybrids occur naturally in nature at times in certain scenarios. And what was happening was, especially in river systems, uh, what we think of as pristine smallmouth bass habitat, we were having scenarios develop where Alabama bass were being stocked and they were interbreeding with smallmouth bass. And we were getting these mutts, uh, half smallmouth or a third smallmouth, two thirds this or whatever. And then you had spotted bass into the mix. And, and now we have species that aren't species anymore at all. They're, they're just weird things. Hmm. Uh, and, and the real fear <clears throat> now is, is if we've seen this start to unravel and develop uh, or disevolve into potentially looking at the New River, for example, uh, where smallmouth bass are native. They're not native to most of Virginia, which makes it, I guess, marginally less fearful for us in the eastern part of the state. But at the same time, we're looking at a world class smallmouth fishery in the New River that could be gone, you know, before I retire, which is really scary because I'm not planning on going anywhere anytime real soon. But um, yeah, I mean, th this, the, we, we've already done a bunch of surveys in the last couple of years from Clater Lake and the New River that show finding a pure smallmouth bass is getting less and less, hmm. um, you know, easy to do. It's becoming harder to find a pure smallmouth. You tend to have, maybe it's 90% smallmouth or 80 or 70 or, or less. And it's got two, three other mycropter species in there with it. Uh, so sadly, yeah. With that said, and this is something I think a lot of people in the comment section, the last time I had this conversation, I want to make sure we make it very clear and precise. What is the difference between a Kentucky bass, a spotted bass, and an Alabama bass? Because I feel like in the comment section, at least, and this is, it could mm -hmm. be wrong, this is anecdotal, people think it's the same fish, but it's mm -hmm. just, it, depending on where question. you are, you call it differently? So spotted spotted bass is its own species. Um, largemouth is a species, smallmouth is a species. Kentucky spotted bass, I, when, when I was going through, when I was at Virginia Tech in undergrad school and we were out on Smith Mountain Lake doing rote known one day and I found a, what I thought was a largemouth and an old gentleman named Bradley Rolls barked at me and said, hey, Kentucky spotted bass, son. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. I never heard of Kentucky spotted bass. Uh, I honestly don't think there is a different species that's called a Kentucky spotted bass. I think it's sort of a vernacular, um, that a local slang that some people call brim, bluegill, okay. blah, 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 okay. you know. Uh, raccoon perch, yellow perch kind of thing. Hmm. So in my, I may be wrong. I'm not always hundred percent right on everything, but I've, I don't think the Kentucky spotted bass is different from a spotted bass. Okay. I think it's just uh, a, a rural slang, uh, if you will, for spotted bass. Um, but so that that's, and then there's, there's a whole bunch of other co-geners that I don't even like Kusa bass and, and Kusa Swanee spot. bass yeah. and, and all these, these like the super endemic to drainages in, in Georgia or somewhere down that way. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you could spend your entire career just working with my crop to species and, and, and that's it, you know? And, uh, so I'm, I'm definitely not an expert on a lot of my crop to species, but I know a little bit about large mouth and small mouth. And I know it's a problem here, but I guess, um, Benarski talked about this with Georgia, like, cause they have, what, what, what bass lives in that one river? I'm going to get killed in the comments section because I don't know that one bass lives in that uh, Georgia river system, but it is a, it's a native species. But when you have the Alabama bass coming in there. And it'll completely destroy. Is it the Shoney bass? I think it is. The Swanee. The Swanee. Thank yeah. you. So, but I, I, it's such a problem, but you can't really distinguish really between them. I think, is that the big? Yeah. Well, we get people, well-meaning people all the time and telling us, they, they, they'll call us without even a picture and say, I, I caught what I think is an Alabama bass, uh, you know, on the South Anna River. This just happened last week. We got a phone, you know, um, well, do you have a picture? No. Why do you think it's Alabama bass? Well, you know, I had some some faint spots that kind of made stripes under the lateral line, and I mean, I don't even try to identify anything from from a verbal description. So, I mean, if you don't have a picture, just don't, please don't call. Even with the picture, I've heard even, you say like okay, so, like you were saying you clipped a fin and you sent it down right. to have it tested. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we've got a couple. So so people send pictures all the time, and and say you know is this. Some of my very good friends that spend a ton of time, you know, kayak fishing, you know, uh, Jim, big Jim. I mean, he's a maniac and he'll, he'll say, man, I got, I think I got an Alabama and he'll send me the picture. And I was like, I don't know, Jim, it kind of looks like a large mouth to me, but I don't, you can't tell that bottom line is nobody can tell without doing a genetic test on it. Uh, which is why we're spending, you know, 12 bucks a pop to send these things down and get a, a definite ID on them. Uh, 
how did you get roped into this? Because you were like literally what head of the Snakehead Task Force in the <laughs> Rappahannock area, and this is near Kerr. I mean, I think this is like the I'm thinking like that part of the Virginia. And how did you get into in this as deep as you have? Well, what happened was in, in, in DWR and the Aquatics Bureau or the Aquatics Division, the Fish Division, we have committees, and I'm the chair of the Reservoir Committee. Okay. Uh, and so one of the things that, that came up uh, w- with the reservoir committee was that we needed to be doing some of it. And it was, this isn't peculiar reservoirs, it obviously encompasses warm water streams, which is another committee we have. So I was working with, with, uh, with Hunter Hatcher and the warm, it was, he was, he was over top of the warm water streams committee at that point, And I was doing the reservoir committee. So we got together uh, and, and we sort of had to, to figure out, look at, you know, how, 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 what's the best way to sample our resources to get a handle and get a baseline on what our genetic diversity of our black bass fisheries are or is. And, and so we reached out to some geneticists, you know, how many samples would you prefer for a body of water, you know, recognizing, you know, the sky's not the limit here. We, we have a budget and, and we have logistics you know, we can't go out and, and, you know, have an unlimited whatever. Uh, so, you know, we got some, some good feedback. We talked to some other states that already were well down the road and dealing with this and, and came up with a, a plan to sort of get some baseline established is what we did a, two and three years ago. Now we, we collected thousands of samples uh, and, and got a really good. And that's when we found out. So we're on the leading edge of this thing. That, that's how we found out that like, holy crap, you know, we're deeper in this than we thought we were. I mean, look at the new river, look at Clater Lake, look at the James River. We've already got Alabama's um, Southeast and Southwest Virginia seem to be the, the hot points. And so I'm in Northern Virginia. So luckily I have not in any of my resources, Lake Anna or the Rappahannock, you know, none of that we've, you know, we've got spotted bass in the Anna drainage, the York, you know, b- below Lake Anna in the North and South Anna, but not detected. We submitted fish there no Alabama genetics in those fish either. Hmm. So, so my, my drainages are clean, but I mean, that's, that's a small ca- consolation for the fact that, you know, in Southwest and Southeast Virginia, we've got problems, uh, because of these people moving fish. Let me, I want to talk to that real quick too. So I know like we've done some private stockings at Lake holiday. What do you like? So people know, and this probably does, that's, this won't stop the, the person that's not going to, they're going to disregard any law or rule anyway, but there is a process. I mean, you can go on line. I know Smith mountain has done some stockings with F one and you guys are not doing it, but in other words, and he was talking about this too, with, you know, fish stocking to go on line at the state and you guys have like an application where you can fill it out and submit it, uh, for approval into a, wouldn't be a public, but a private body of water, but, or even a public if fishermen or anglers said, you know, we think this is a good idea. Is there a process you should go through do you have a process to go through right? Well, you, instead you, of just yeah. moving it on their own, like you're saying? You pose some of an interesting question and sort of a, a bit of a gray area. So it's, it's illegal to put any fish mm-hmm. in public waters without authorization. Got it. And that stocking authorization is it's a free permit. Mm-hmm. It doesn't cost anything. So if you want to, you don't need that for a private pond. Right. But people like, uh, it's it's more common with uh, salmonids, with trout. Pe- people mm-hmm. have, a, like, say they own, you know, 100 acres mm-hmm. in, in Madison County, and they've got a nice stream running in their backyard, mm-hmm. and they want to put some, some rainbows, some brown trout in there mm-hmm. or something. And they will because that's public water it's mm. flowing even though it flows through their property and mm. they kind of control access to it it's still public water uh, because it's flowing mm-hmm. and, and and so they need to come to us for stocking authorization mm-hmm. uh, and in that case i just mentioned you know we would probably recommend if they're not going to stock well even if they're stocking brook trout at this point if, if they're if they're stocking over wild trout water we're going to ask them to make sure they get mm-hmm. triploid fish mm-hmm. so that they can't reproduce mm-hmm. with other trout or create a self-sustaining mm-hmm. population that might compete with native brook trout. Uh, so that's just sort of an example. Now, what you said about uh, a larger HOA type lake, now that is a real gray area because number one, it's not open to the public, mm-hmm. uh, but you are required to have a fishing license on that because mm-hmm. it's not owned by, entirely mm-hmm. by one person within one's property. Uh, and, and we do, uh, law enforcement at times will mm-hmm. patrol those mm-hmm. types of waters and we do provide assistance, mm-hmm. technical assistance mm-hmm. and sometimes surveys for Correct. Lake of the Woods mm-hmm. or uh, Fawn Lake, places like that. And, and and so they are, I, I do believe in those cases, you would still want to file a stocking authorization. And part of that too, I thought was good is, is a certificate also showing that uh, they have no disease. Like there are certain things too, which I think is really good because even a fish that maybe you have that species, making sure that hatchery or stocking entity has been, I guess, regulated or whatever, so that you're not bringing 
even a native fish in, but one that, that may have disease that could also damage your, your existing population. Right. And yeah. So, so our, the fish that we stock ourselves from our own hatcheries, mm -hmm. of course, they're, they're all mm -hmm. tested and certified to be mm -hmm. certain levels of disease mm -hmm. free. Mm -hmm. And then the commercial hatcheries that are out there that we, even we buy fish from sometimes because right. it's, it's like for the hybrid stripers and Anna we just stocked last gotcha. week. A lot of times it's cheaper for us to put those out to bid and buy them than it is for us to, or, you know, we don't have the space or the, gotcha. the means to produce those in-house. So we'll, we'll put it out to bid and the, the, the Mark Fry, the gentleman that brought those fish from Elizabeth City, North Carolina, you know, he had the paperwork on them and they were all yeah. certified disease free. Uh, so, yeah, so we'll follow the same things that we ask mm -hmm. others to do to make sure that we're not bringing in, mm -hmm. you know, uh, problem fish from out of state, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, we have a lot of fish moving through here from Arkansas or from Florida, mm -hmm. you know, Mississippi. Interesting. And, and, and guys, just to make sure that this isn't glossed over, the reason that you need to do genetic sampling on this compared to like when, if you're in the upper Potomac, because that's where I live right now, where you know what a flathead looks like, you mm -hmm. can identify it visually. You know, with the Alabama bass situation, it needs to have genetic sampling done mm -hmm. because you can't just Correct. stare at it and be like, Correct. this is sure, because then you get 6,000 mm -hmm. photos of, and you have to decipher through. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I think is really interesting that, I, that you touched on on the show I watched you on, which was talking about clear water or, or very fertile bodies of water, eutrophic versus allogrophic. If I said that one right, allogrophic. Allogrophic being more clear. I'm thinking like late Hartwell, places like where they really do very well versus a eutrophic body of water, maybe, I don't like Chesden, the Rappahannock sure. maybe. Well, basically anything in the mm -hmm. east of 95 or, and it's even considered eutrophic. Well, and it's got more of a, of a trophic gradient than a lot of lakes because really? it's, it's a big lake with tiny tributaries feeding it. Okay. So the hydraulic retention time is relatively long. Hmm. Um, versus something like Chesden or, uh, what I'm trying to think, uh, probably more, even more than Gaston, um, you know, Occoquan, okay. short retention time relative to Anna. Um, uh, but yeah, you're, you're right. And, and so eutrophic waters, more nutrient rich waters typically are, are the visibility is lower. So when you think of oligotrophic lakes, think of like Lake Muma or Adirondacks, mm -hmm. you know, these pretty lakes, pretty, uh, they just gin clear, you know, you can see mm -hmm. 30, 40 feet down. Okay, that's not productive though. Mm -hmm. um, you're not growing near the pounds per acre of fish in, in, in that lake that you could have in Lake Anna or Occoquan or Burke or wherever. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually fertilize some of the state-owned lakes, like hmm. Burke and Brittle, Orange, um, to create that phytoplankton bloom. To We artificially are enhancing the primary productivity. We're speeding up the eutrophication of those reservoirs for fish production. Uh, it's a part of our management philosophy. And we just had to do a study to make sure we weren't exporting our nutrients. Was, we came back looking very good in that. Uh, but but well, your point is well taken that um, the Alabama bass in particular, they don't like mud apparently, um, which is good for say maybe, well, the interbreeding with smallmouth to me is, is the most problematic aspect of this. But in terms of what we saw in North Carolina and uh, Lawrence's study, I'm trying to remember the name of the lake. Um, it wasn't Norris, that's Tennessee. It was... Uh, Anyway, I'll think of it in a minute, but I, I think the, the 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 potential of Alabama's display out competing and displacing largemouth is going to be greater in 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 lakes that are leaning more oligotrophic than eutrophic. So the lakes that are more clear, more rocky, um, like Dale Hollow, maybe in Tennessee, lakes where you have more smallmouth type of uh, habitat, mm -hmm. so, yeah. that's going to be more of a of a premier Lake Lanier places place like that for for okay. Alabama to make its move. Uh, rather than than a purely eutrophic, but not to say it can't happen in a eutrophic lake, but it's 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 less of a concern I think at this point. Because I feel from like I'll, a large mass standpoint. Sorry. If I try to if I had to create a hypothesis in the angler's head when they think of like a spot and because they I think they get them confused. You think of the big time spot lakes of Lake Hartwell, Lake Lanier, where you're seeing twenty pound bags, but that is also the instance where you have a thriving blueback herring population. That I wonder if that's what is almost it. It gives you a fake readout of what they can do because if you pull out the herring of that place i don't think you see those weights hmm. i don't think that's very successful and it's stunted but i think people get this idea it's like well we can create a lake hartwell at gaston well i've heard the same about this. spots even too spotted yeah. bass where they're real aggressive and yeah they're fun to catch but but how does that and i think the point too to your point is is how do they relate together? How do they how, how do they all work together it, in that community? Yeah, in, in the papers and the PowerPoint where you brought up the blueback herring, I thought that's just a very interesting thing, like where these two are always introduced in the same place and they only do well in the same thing. And again, maybe it's just a coincidence, mm. but I just found that fascinating. Hmm. It is. And, and it does seem like in, in some of the cases, and this is something that Lawrence was talking about on one of the conference calls we had 
it seems like when when Alabama when they discover Alabama bass in a new water, within a short period of time, all of a sudden there's herring in that water too. It's it's weird. Yeah, <laughs> it's like not only are they moving the fish, but they're moving the fish in, and it's forage, um, which huh. you know, it, it's, yeah, it's 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 really sad. Um, you know, we've got Lake Anna's got blueback herring, uh, Occoquan Reservoir has alewives naturally self-sustaining in both populations. And those are the only two I'm well, there's also, um, Smith mountain, I believe has, has one of the two. They got blue back. Yeah. And, uh, and I believe some of the other lakes down in region two have, have as well. That's not to say that it, it would be a good habitat for, for Alabama's or not. I mean, it's just, that's just a fact of the forage base that's there. Um, and it, honestly, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think that's going to play a big role in sort of Virginia's um, experience with this Alabama uh, invasion. You know, I, I don't necessarily think that, that that whether or not there's herring in a, a water body is, is really here or there. I just, I, I, it, there's much more. Um, I just thought it was interesting. I, it is. Yeah, interesting. yeah. I just thought it was interesting yeah. um, that Lawrence, and I really got to get it. I got to figure out how to get him on the show. Cause this is, yeah, sorry guys. This is an interesting read. All the stuff I he'll, 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 he'll jump on. He'll um, jump The salinity thing. I wanted to bring that up because I, f- I forgot to ask Mr. Sikorsky uh, about the James, but it's right. I, and I know I asked you this too, but it's like right. on the record, like is there any like how well will they handle title situations if they get into the title James? Is that, that that's something I can honestly say I have no freaking clue about. Uh, I don't know if if they can handle one part per thousand. I don't know what they think of title systems being. Like you compare the trophic system or tidal systems, like even, you know, I mean, talk about murky, zero viz, um, you know, so I, it doesn't seem to me like it's in their wheelhouse, um, but not to say it can't happen. I mean, obviously largemouth do quite well in, uh, in you know, mm. some, some brackish water and, and fairly reasonable levels of salinity. Uh, but you know, typically smallmouth, no, maybe some freshwater tidal, but like zero salinity that my knowledge for smallmouth. So I, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question and it's one that we should probably explore a little bit and try to get a handle on, talk to some more folks down in our, you know, Southeastern coastal states and see if they've seen Alabama's. In fact, I can, I could probably send Lawrence an email later today on that uh, because I don't know. Cause I think, yeah, what are the yeah. fears of tidal Rappahannock, the tidal James, the Potomac, right. like of, of that becoming right. a hotbed for these things. Cause like, again, I hate to, I always ask this question to everyone with this or the blue cats, but it's like, what the hell can you do now once they get into a place? Like, right. I, I mean, yeah. and that's not like I'm asking you like what to, but like, that's like you said earlier, yeah. you can't, it's done. It's, You've already, it's done. Yep. Yeah. And the small mouth thing is terrifying because mm-hmm. it's, I don't know what can be done about that. And, and something I've always thought about is, does this make supplemental stocking more important for like the smallmouth or something like that, just to be able to keep the genetics good and keep them alive? I mean, I'm not saying like tomorrow, but mm-hmm. if you're thinking 10, 20, 30 years, a long-term plan, I feel like that's going to become a more important conversation to have. It is, you know, and the front Royal, you know, I, I just got my Virginia wildlife today. I didn't even look at it. Um, shout about, out to the Halliker and all that. Yeah. About the front Royal, uh, the improvements that were because of the law, the lawsuit that came out mm-hmm. of the contamination. Um, and the ability potentially of us, I mean, this is something we've known about for 20 years. I mean, well, Scott Smith and Steve Reeser and I published a paper in like 1995. Was it that long ago? It didn't seem possible. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, but I mean, we've understood what's going on with the smallmouth in our rivers for a long time. And it's not rocket science. It's not nearly as hard as trying to figure out what's going on with these Alabamas and largemouth mm-hmm. and smallmouth. I mean, reproduction of smallmouth in our traditional smallmouth rivers, right? Forget the Alabamas are jumping on everybody but you know if, if you have a, a normal flow in the spring typically the late spring in mm-hmm. june it's usually june um if you're anywhere close to the median flow you're going to have a good spawn mm-hmm. and, and the problem is we've been farther and farther from being close to that happy place for many years now it's either way low or it's way high mm-hmm. and then you get ass reproduction um and that's what we've had a lot. And that's why our fisheries have been up and down quite a bit. And our idea behind Front Royal, and we tried an experimental stocking back probably 10 to 15 years ago. We just, we couldn't buy or raise enough of smallmouth bass to make it work. Because mm-hmm. when you're doing it, when you're trying to supplement a failed year class or multiple failed year yeah. classes mm-hmm. in, in a system of any size, whether it's the, uh, you know, the tidal Chickahominy for largemouth or, you know, a chunk of the James River for smallmouth, 
you know, we're talking six figures easily of fish. And, and smallmouth are notoriously, maybe except mm. for the Asasas, the pike and uh, musky family, the, the smallmouth are pretty much one of the hardest fish to raise and rear in hatcheries and produce at, at a, a commercial level. And, and we, we just, we couldn't get it. We, and so that was hope, our hope and prayers behind Front Royal was, mm -hmm. was dumping this money um, uh, from, from, from this lawsuit into creating a facility that where we could mm -hmm. remediate uh, failed year classes of smallmouth stocking uh, in the Shenandoah or the James or Rappahannock. Probably not everyone every year, but, you know, generally they sort of function in a regional level. You know, if, if, if although this year is a lot different, you know, we're dry as hell up here in the north part and the south part of Virginia, they got all the water they need. Um, but usually it's a regional thing. But when it's not, it's even better and it's easier because if we do have the production to stock, you know, a couple hundred thousand smallmouth and, and the Rappahannock took it on the chin or the Shenandoah took it on the chin this year, then we can try to, you know, mitigate that failed year class or typically it would be more than one. And, and, and so down the road, the fish is not going to be terrible. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. And, and hopefully it'll happen maybe in the not too distant future. And I have a call into Halliker, guys. So I'm going to be getting Halliker on the show this Good. fall to talk about the fish hatchery yeah. there. Because we also, we were the we were the show that broke the Maryland situation mm. where they've been stocking smallmouth successfully mm. for two to three years mm. now. And based on on your your experience with Lake Holiday, there's like, what, one place in the country, two yeah, places in the country yeah, that does we, that? When so we look Maryland, for them, you're 100 Virginia, right. it's crazy. I mean, I think John, another John Reedy up there, he looked, I want to say it was 150 to 200 hatcheries across the country, and, and we settled in on one out of Ohio fenders, and he's like second generation. And when we talked to him, because he, like you're saying, there's times too, he'll buy from other, other sources as well. He's got his own farm he's raising, but he'll also get, you know, different species from different places. And he said, yeah, they're – more and more you're seeing them go out of business. They're not for smallmouth specifically because to your point, they are so hard to raise. And that honestly too, in this area right here with the Shando river, North and South Fork of Shando and the Potomac. I mean, that's, that's this fishery here. I mean, that's, I mean, you have a little bit of, you have large mouth and some ponds, but the smallmouth is, and you mentioned the new, but the smallmouth river rats around here, that's, that's the bread and butter here and so there is and this yeah. should be alarming this this whole alabama situation yeah. for them is this is going to mm -hmm. hit hard and and it's so i i found at least since i broke that episode with with uh dr sikorsky was people were really they look at a flathead and they like this is more of a, a danger mm -hmm. to a smallmouth because you're going to see this big ass yeah. scary creature eat a smallmouth potentially right well, they and do. they don't truly appreciate the silent death that mm -hmm. putting an Alabama bass into your estuary, mm -hmm. your fishery, will have in the long run. Mm -hmm. It is the the real killer, not just a mm -hmm. not a flathead necessarily. Right. Um, and I think people really just need to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, again, and this is something else. It's like I've I talked to Joe Love about this, and I brought this up with 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 um with Martin about the blue cats when they talked about like s harvesting to be mm -hmm. able to get them out there. And I popped the question to both of them. And again, no one's probably gonna have to answer this, but how many tons or how much weight do you need to pull out mathematically each month to see a dent in the population? And both of them are like, no idea. And it's like, well then how, what's the next step there to do something? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Or do you have any? <laughs> On the blue cats or blue cats, but like taking that math equation and transferring it over to like the Alabama bass. Yeah. I mean, that's just two different things that going on there. One is exploit, trying to exploit or over exploit a population to achieve some level of control. Mm -hmm. and, and that in most cases has been mostly a failure. Yeah. It's going to bring that up. Um, flathead catfish in the Georgia for years, the Altamaha river, other rivers where they, the flatheads were, were introduced and um, caused, you know, wreaking havoc on, on the, the centrarchids, whether it's the, the red ears or whatever, that their favorite fishery went down the tubes. Um, but the bottom line is, and the larger the system, of course, the harder it gets. But, but you, you typically have to have so much effort to suppress a population to, to have some meaningful level of change, but, but you, you can never stop. Right. As soon as you start to back off, that population is going to come back. And, 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 and this is sort of sort of an invasive one on one thing where, you know, whether it's, it's brown trout in a, in a small stream in Shenandoah National Park, you know, they'll go down and they'll backpack shock and do it, you know, search, search and destroy mission on that stream from, from the whole stream. I mean, literally from the park boundary to the headwaters where there's no water. And they'll, they'll shock that entire stream and take out every brown trout they can get. And they, we got them all. And they go back three years later, there's still brown trout. 
Um, so it, it's the le- and then you look at well, how much effort are you expending to do this? Yeah. And and, and what's you know what, what are some other things you could be doing in terms of habitat or, or you know whatever? Yeah. Uh, and is that the best use of the resource, or your resources, uh, for that resource? Yeah, because I'm not saying that they, it should now. Just for the clarify the record, I'm not saying that it shouldn't be done. I was just interested because I've had so many episodes talking about the blue cat issue about removing the species. And then you look at what's going on with the snakehead and this is randomly fact. I've been exploring what's going on in Japan with largemouth because it is state enemy number one there, but they can't get rid of it. Even though they have the whole nation's resources to try to get rid of it, they can't get rid of the largemouth there. So how the hell are we going to get rid of the blue cat or the snakehead? It doesn't seem like. Well, what's interesting though, too, it goes back to what you were talking about users and same thing you've always said, tribal, like fishermen are tribal. And so if yeah, you're the catfish guy that the debate comes up, then you mm-hmm. like the, the smallmouth guy wants to kill it. The catfish guy's like, what the heck are you doing? Right. And so it's each to their own. And I think, and that's why I think we're in the situation we're in because what I think is good what I like to catch, what I think is good, we need to put that there, but yeah. you may not agree with it. You want something different. And I think that's why we kind of get in this mess. But but it goes back to what you guys have the data. You guys are professionals. You've gone to school, you studied this. You have 30 years experience in this. We've got to be asking, we've got to ask the question first, is this a wise decision to put it in and, and then do our homework before we just go in and dump these things in? Because Yeah, I just don't know how you get them out of there. Because like, I mean, again, like... I, even if you if you had a number to say like a ton per month, great. At least you have a number. But when you don't know, because you know whether it's the Alabama bass or the blue, how do we use our resources better to figure out a way to to alleviate this problem, mitigate this problem? Like I don't, I don't, I don't have. And an I answer. see now why Virginia has had such a, from my experience, even with say deer, or, you know, mule deer or whatever. Like it's like kind of like this is this is what we have. This is what works. Like let's not introduce something foreign to it that may throw out you know, the existing balance and anything you do, same thing with turkey population was up. If you introduce rattlesnakes, now you got a rattlesnake problem, right? So it's like, you know what I mean? And right. it's like mother nature, you almost just have to leave her alone. But, but I don't know the answer to your question. No, no. I, other than yeah, to his point, like yeah. we got to, you got to stop it at its source. Yes, you do. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I don't think we can go back and change what's been done, but. Two thoughts. One, and I wanted to clear up something I mentioned a moment ago there's there's no question that humans can overexploit a, a fishery resource. Mm-hmm. Okay, this, obviously it's happened many many times, usually in the commercial realm, mm-hmm. uh, which right. now with the blue catfish, of course, that's that's part of the angle. So yeah, I don't think anyone can <coughs> say that the commercial pressure and the harvest that's occurring hasn't impacted the blue catfish population. Nor can one say that about the snakeheads. Um, there's, there's, I think definitely exploitation comes into play when we look at mortality rates of these populations. I think the problem is, to some extent, is, is that the blue catfish population is so much larger. Mm-hmm. And other, mm. people have done modeling and tried to figure out, you know, for a river system or part of a river system or for the bay, you know, how many blue catfish within some confidence interval might be out there. Uh, and, and, you know, it's of course, it's a big number. And, and but what percentage of that needs to be right. depleted to suppress the stock? But then we get back into what I was already talking about. Once you start suppressing the stock, does that kick the population into a higher reproductive yeah, potential? Interesting. Um, and what you take out is replaced you know, almost immediately. It's, and that level of effort has to be maintained. Um, so I, I think with, with snakeheads, what we saw uh, for a long time was that exploitation rates were creeping up. And then we kind of hit a max... Uh, or, or should I say, I should say total annual mortality rates were creeping up to close to 50% in some cases. And, and, and a lot of that is fishing mortality, especially when you bring in the archery angle. And, and, um, but it now it's, it's, it seems like it's backed off a little bit of that, but, but a lot of that sampling variability too, because that gets back to this modeling thing, you know, at least with the snakeheads, some of our, our data are, are a little bit more pure. In other words, they're not, it's not theoretical. We're, it's, we're not getting stuff out of a fancy long model. We can actually go out and collect data, look at Otolis. Um, you know, granted, it's a subset of a population or a subset of the, the community, uh, the larger, you know, expanse, because typically you think of snakeheads are, you know, different populations. But um, anyway, if you, if you look mm-hmm. at these, these different data points, I think you, it's safe to make an argument that, you know, what we're seeing is real in that this year it was 45%, last year it was 38%. I, I, think, I think those are probably 
within the the, the level of variability that, that would be acceptable in terms of error. When you start looking at blue catfish, my God, you know, it's just so much bigger to me. It's so much mm. more difficult a thing to get your arms around. Um, so yeah, it's each invasive is different. Yeah. You know, people, people try mm. to paint invasives with the same brush stroke and, and there, you can't because not only are each one's different, but the system it's in, uh, dictates a different mm. outcome or a different management philosophy in many mm. cases, or it should. Do different invasives have a different runway when it comes to getting a body of water back to homeostasis or is it? No, I don't think so. And there, there's, there's a guy named Williamson wrote a, 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 at least one, I think multiple texts called invasive, invasive theory or invasion theory, Williamson. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's what what he looks at it and it's like you have all these different organisms and, and they for whatever reason they end up in a novel environment most of them don't do anything they just don't make it but the ones that do excel okay they have certain attributes and you could look at snakeheads for an example and come up with those um and then they do really well and then the ones that do well having a competitive advantage for a time period of time uh and, and their numbers will increase their abundance will increase it might take 10 years. It might take 20. It might take 30, but at some point the numbers are going to stop increasing. It has to. Mm -hmm. And then usually the numbers begin to decline. So it's a bell curve. Yes. An inverted parabola and uh, the vertex is at the top. And uh, for instance, with snakeheads, I think we saw that in 2013, 2014, it took about 10 to 15 years for that to happen. To me, the blue catfish took longer because it's a longer lived species and it's a much larger species. Mm -hmm. It's just got a different life history. Um, so we didn't see the full maturation of that population or those populations, you know, for decades hmm. versus 10 to 15 years. Yeah, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Because you look at where the snakehead has it seemed it's carved out a niche, not only in, in the cultural zeitgeist, but also in these estuaries where, again, I remember when we had you on and that, I mean, the great episode, by the way, guys, that thank you guys for mm -hmm. making that a really good episode and you look at from day one when people are calling you up that this thing's going to eat their dog to them having a great tribal following, but they found their niche in the environment almost. And again, I'm speaking without the same knowledge as you. And then you look at different species like the blue cat, the zebra mussel, the Alabama bass, which I think everyone agrees Alabama bass is a mm -hmm. problem, but how each one affects it differently. It's it's not blanket like, like you said. I mean, like you said, based on water. Because I was thinking too, forage, I mean, the, the amount of water, because I, I automatically go to the Susquehanna River too, where, I mean, you've heard that certain predominantly smallmouth holes are now, they're gone because the catfish have moved in. And if the, the forage is not flat there, heads. flatheads, flatheads. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, so depending on, to your point, the body of water too, and, and can it sustain that? Or like a Smith Mountain Lake, where can it, can it sustain that population? Is there enough forage? enough groceries for for everybody to coexist you know and i think the problem we run into a lot of times too is these smaller the rivers are problematic because there's not as much volume of water not as much areas for them to go and so they're now moving out or like you said there's not the forage so they have they've gotten big and they have to eat that small mouth because that's their dinner well it also comes down to the anglers i think it's probably <laughs> the alabama bass and you know when you're transporting it across mm -hmm. you know from one body of water to the other and with the flathead the biggest thing i did when i actually got on the ground and started interviewing these anglers me being an idiot that i am a flathead angler's primary blade mm -hmm. is bluegill right what do they do they go and they cast Catch net the 30 to 40 bluegill yeah. that they Bottom. use mm -hmm. so it's not only which is the, illegal in virginia which is not only because that's never stopped anyone from doing it. but it's so you now you have the angler and the species mm -hmm. destroying one population together right so that's even more exacerbated exactly there. and it's just such a little little like nuance which goes back situation. to what you're saying yeah. I mean, you could catch that bluegill and then yeah, cut it legal. and put it back out there that's legal but that goes back to what i said before about like most people that break the law they're not gonna right. you can mm -hmm. have the but if we can and back to your point i think it's almost it's our responsibility to police it too as as not your responsibility our responsibility as anglers right. that do know uh or to educate and or to try to curb it the best we can that this is not good like no, this is not going to be tolerated in this system how many years based on this study this is a hell of a transition here uh you did i don't know if this is the one with the lake norman study this is the one with lake norman study i think it is i think this is okay cool uh it was over a 10 to 20 year period and you're talking and and Again, this is probably me being negligent when you're comparing and contrast this with other species, but are you going to see the bell curve? Are you seeing the bell curve like we talked about 
with the the Alabama bass on that specific body of water? And is that something that you could extrapolate out to like, is this what we're going to see happen at a Lake Gaston occur, places like that? Uh, let me try to make that a little bit clear. What we're seeing at Lake Norman, is that what we're probably going to be seeing at some of these other bodies of water that they're infected in? Maybe. <laughs> um, honestly, I don't know that much about, like we were talking about eutrophic status. I don't know how much, uh, I don't know that much about Lake Norman and, and what the habitat is like there or was like there um, and how conducive it would be for Alabama colonization. Um, now, what I think one of the points of this, of this particular graph, though, is that, that the shift um, was was not necessarily additive, but it was mostly compensatory, meaning that you, uh, what's, what's interesting is that when you, when you have a new species, okay, and that species increases in abundance, did it do that as an additive component, meaning that it's just extra fish biomass in the system, or was it compensatory? Did it take away from something? Mm. And so that's always a key, whether we're stocking the same species and a hatchery fish versus a wild fish, hmm. or it's a different species. Uh, and, and so that is an interesting question you always would like to ask. And so in this case, um, I think the point being that the, the, the added biomass was, mm -hmm. was not additive. It looks like it was to me, it looks like it was, well, it wasn't necessarily totally compensatory on, on largemouth large because your largemouth abundance seems like it, it's at least as high catch rate after Alabama showed up. But was on the smallmouth. The smallmouth that well, yeah, but the smallmouth they surged right after. And why 2005? Was there a climate, uh, a cl something in the climate that happened that year? What about 2005? Yeah, I, I, think, saw that I think that's when Alabama's were found. Is that's when they found. Okay. I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, this, this is not my talk. I have given this talk, but it's been about. Um, three or four months since I looked at it. Gotcha, so gotcha, gotcha. I don't honestly remember. I'm pretty sure 05 was the year they discovered Alabama's. Well, this is Blue Ridge Reservoir too in Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, this is not uh, Norman. Or Can we real yes, quick? Yes, yes. We'll go through the talk a little bit. Uh, so I think there's some other graphs further down that might, um, like, yeah. Yep. Uh, there's Lake Norman. There's there Norman. it is. That's the, this is okay, the one. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> so, th this this looks a little worse for large. If you like to catch large mouth bass, right? Mm -hmm. If, if you want to catch little tiny Alabamas all day long and a whole bunch of them, then maybe this is your jam. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I prefer to catch, you know, four, five, five, six, seven, eight uh, versus a one or two all day. Um, so, anyway, what we can see at, at Lake Norman, and this is Lawrence's data, uh, basically, large mouth went away. Alabama's got really abundant. And all bass stayed the same, meaning it wasn't additive, it was compensatory. And you'd get that from the top two, but but the bottom graph just yeah. shows you that. I'm gonna link in the episode description, guys. I will find your the 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 thing you recorded where you went through this. And it was a couple months back okay. when you were really on it. I'm gonna link that in the episode description, guys, where he goes through slide by slide. And I'll also link the one with, with, with Benarski, because we're you're gonna have a shitload of stuff to, to read on this whole topic because it is fascinating. I'm fascinated to see what happens with Lake Norman since there's been so much sampling done on that to see what happens in five, six, seven, eight years right. with, with that whole thing. Um, poof, that's so fascinating. And I got to get Lawrence on the show. got to add him to my list. Yeah, I got to um, tackle him. Yeah, send me a note while you're on your computer. Because I think that's interesting when it comes to, and that's something else I wanted to hit on, is is how weather patterns, global warming, climate change, whatever the heck you guys want to call it in the comment section, with the smallmouth, and we're talking about their spawn classes, and we're talking about things warming up. And that is that's that is more conducive to Alabama bass, correct? And what they prefer versus a smallmouth? Yeah, it could be. Um, and, and there are concerns to some extent about, water temperature and our small mass streams. But to me, it, it I'm I, personally, and what I've seen, I'm less concerned about the temperature with regards to small mouth, um, than I am with the flow extremes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, both are probably being driven by changes in climate. Okay. So, I mean, it's all, everything's always changing. Uh, so, you know, what, what is, as long as we don't get, back to where we have some sort of a normal hydrograph in the spring when these fish are trying to spawn, mm -hmm. we're not going to, unless there was some massive adaptation, like we find out Atlantic sturgeon are spawning in the fall. How long have they been doing that? I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe, you know, they've got the magic key to unlock this stuff. Uh, who knows? Uh, mother nature is resilient in many respects and has been. So, you know, that's one thing I've learned too in my career is 
um, and never say it can't happen. Right. <laughs> Things that I thought couldn't happen that sometimes happen. <laughs> uh, so I've learned to respect that um, many things are possible that you might not expect. To to put a to kind of put a bow on the Alabama bass situation, like what do you what are you guys working on now that you're allowed to talk about what's next with all this that's going on? Well, essentially, we're just trying to help educate. Like what we're doing today is 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 you know things like this outreach, um, make anglers aware, and we're going to keep testing. You know, we're not going to be testing thousands. Well, we actually we just did a contract, and a lot of this was for makeup samples we've had sitting uh we just got a contract to send in a little over a thousand plus fish um some of those are f1 fish for our reservoir study but a lot of those are alabama testing fish we, it's we rolled it into a single genetic contract this this time uh so but i believe more than half of those are probably alabama bass related so anyway we're, we're going to continue looking at the genetic shifts or hopefully not big shifts but we're looking at the genetic makeup of our black bass fisheries and we will continue to do that probably forever at this point as a line item in the budget genetic contract um and in in, in doing our, our field sampling to determine what's happening with the populations you know are we seeing decrease in abundance of x y or z uh change in average size things like that um so you know I mean, that, that's, that's what we do. And that's, that's, you know, for us to be a steward of the resource, we have to understand what's happening in that resource. Uh, and then of course, creel surveys are a part of that, or we have people out interviewing anglers, asking about their experiences and what they caught and what they like to see. Um, so yeah, I mean, gathering those data, whether they're fishery dependent or independent data and, and, and analyzing the, the, the makeup of those genetic components is that that's, that's a, our big, you know, that should help us answer and address the questions. I think we'll let, let's keep it with the invasive talk now because I want to segue to, to Lake mm -hmm. Anna. Um, so, and I think this is really highlighted for this past weekend for Bassmasters because they were up at Lake, the St. Lawrence River. Four people caught over 100 pounds of smallmouth over four days. It's never happened before, the weights they've had. Cayuga had the same fish caught two years in a row, allegedly, that was almost 10 pounds for mm. smallmouth. Wow. It's because of the zebra mussels and the gobies, and I'm not I'm not saying transport them. What I'm saying is, in some, are all invasive species created equal? And I know this is more of a, a softball question there, because whether it's this or the hydrilla, it's just so fascinating to me. Because is there some ecological impact? Yes. Is there a financial incentive for all the money that's being made up there right now? Yes. It's so fascinating to me what's going on up there, and I just think it's a interesting question to have and to your point you're not the only one because these anglers that do go up to st lawrence it was brought up about yeah we need you know need the goby you know type thing like that's the idea to think that well that's what's making these things fat like it's and so no, it's a great question is what i'm saying because that's what's being said because that's what's being said and, and that's what I, and leads to yeah. what you're saying is people and whether or not that's a great question not and, and and it's not about moving them it's just about invasives in general as yes. a whole and I just have always wanted to have that that conversation. Yeah. Just your thoughts on it. Well, it's, I mean, <clears throat> I, I've, I gave a lecture to a graduate class at George Mason a few months ago oh, about cool. invasive. And and, and and no, I started out my talk with saying they're not all, they're not equal. None of them are equal. They're all different, and you have to look at each one independently. But so frequently in our system, you hear that the acronyms INS or invasive nuisance species or aquatic. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's all these acronyms and policies that are made for invasive species. You know, and it's like it, it, we, that will dictate it's invasive. And then it goes into this category, and it's like, you, you, but you can't because they're all different. It even I mean, for example, even even in DWR within our aquatics, our our, mm -hmm. our brotherhood and sisterhood, we can't agree on hydrilla. Mm -hmm. We've got people that hate yeah. hydrilla and they want to just nuke it. They see one stitch and they want to just destroy it. And mm -hmm. then we got other people, and I'm I'm more in the other people camp where I think hydrilla's got a lot of really beneficial qualities. Uh, and as long as you can kind of keep it in check, um, I think it's very beneficial. So what, what drives that? Cause that's fast. You said that you've said that before. What drives that within your industry with your professionals? What drives the difference of opinion? It's just life experiences and personal experiences with, with that, in that organism and, and what huh. outcomes they have heard that's or seen or interpreted okay. maybe incorrectly. Maybe right, correctly. right, right. Um, hmm. so yeah, it, 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 that's it, interesting. it is hard. Because, you know, a, a fish right here or a plant right here may be 
um, loved and, and, you know, mm -hmm. you go over here and it's, it's hated and despised. And, and, and that's probably never going to change. Um, but, you know, so we, we have to manage each system with the organisms that are in it, you know, for the bit. And we, the, the most important thing is to go back and look at the system. Okay. If it's a river, the, the, the path is the, the, the chartered path is easier because, because the river is, I mean, that's, that is a, we're the stewards of that resource. And, and it's, you know, we're going to, we're going to try to maintain the natural populations, mm -hmm. the native populations as best we can, you know, for future generations. If, the, and, and typically in a, if the case of the Potomac, for example, even though that's a Maryland river, not a Virginia river, but the Potomac Virginia tributaries are very similar. Um, you know, probably half of the species out there are not native. So you get in this situation where we're managing largemouth bass, we're managing mm -hmm. bluegill. Um, you know, the people are very important, but they're not native. Uh, so, you know, sometimes when we when we look at these big pictures, we have to bear that in mind. You know, the channel catfish, everybody's concerned, well, the blue catfish are going to, you know, there's no channel catfish left because of the blues. Well, the, the channels aren't native either. And uh, the good mm -hmm. Dr. Love and I had had a lively exchange back in the snakehead symposium. When, oh, boy. When I had, um, you know, he... he, he uh, my, my contention was that, you know, we haven't seen a decline in, in the, in the, the, the food items that snakeheads like to eat, the banded killifish being the tidal Potomac, bluegill typically in the reservoirs are the most, most it's, it's just, the snakehead's a true uh, uh, opportunistic. It's mm -hmm. going to eat whatever's in front of its face when it's hungry. It doesn't matter. I honestly mm -hmm. believe it does not matter. And it's going to inhale that. And in the, where do they live? Heavily vegetated shallows, mm -hmm. right? What's there? Well, in the rivers, it's, it's either a bluegill or a banded killifish. In the lakes, it's probably a bluegill. Or a pumpkin seed, a mm -hmm. lapomus, a round-shaped sunfish, and and but what difference? I said I looked at Joe. I said, what difference does it make? He's like, well, it's not native. I said, well, neither is a bluegill or a pumpkin seed. How did you get I this perspective? That. How did like no? Is it was it based? Because I see a lot of this is maybe about how your education was. When I took some of these biology classes back at Shenandoah University, it was taught invasives are blank. It's a blank thing. Mm -hmm. it, there's no nuance to it. Was this just a, living a life or was this your education or what gave you this, this I viewpoint? I still remember a little bit of my education, but at this point it's been, <laughs> it's been a, it's been a while. Um, Probably a lot of personal experience, I would think. Yeah. I, honestly, it, it's, it's personal experience. Um, just dealing, spending my whole life managing fish, both for the federal government and the state government that, are either native or, or non-native. There's pretty much only two choices there. Um, you know, so, but just because it's not native to me doesn't make it invasive. You know, the federal government's got the definition that most states have adopted uh, that says that, you know, to me it's invasive, it causes economic or ecological damage. And that's pretty straightforward. And most people would agree with that. But my problem with the feds and us is, is we tack on at the end or may. I mean, so we shouldn't walk outside because we might get struck by lightning mm -hmm. or hit by an asteroid or whatever. I, you know, I just think that's a little bit of a cop out, uh, personally, with apologies to Fish Chief Mike. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I think, too, for you, what I think is fascinating is you have the book. You have the book. You have the research. You have the study. And but then you also have the field where you spend a lot of time in the field as a hunter and fisherman and, and just that. And where do those two where do they match up and they, they agree with each other and where do somebody's whoever wrote that book or that literature versus what and i think the snakehead is a great example too back to that story when you were talking about it, again when it first hit like oh my god but when your first two phone calls to where they originated to say and they're saying you're saying what's the problem they're like problem there's no problem like right so but anybody else here and so then but then now from the very beginning timeline now you're seeing that those things are coexisting to your point like it didn't devastate anything like in fact you know so but how do you know that if you read a book mm -hmm. the book's going to tell you it's bad mm -hmm. but if you go in the field and look is it is it bad because people like catch them they love eating them like and and they're coexisting you know what i mean is that i think that too is boots on the ground it's sometimes different than what you you're going to read in a book. The economic impact too, where I think there's going to be something passed by fishermen to where snakehead get a little bit more protection. I think that's going to happen. I think there's a vote coming up in two, is it two years, three years? I don't, I don't, I don't know hundred percent, but where can anglers vote on something like that to mm, Well, they like, so we do, or so let me first back up yeah. and say that we, we haven't identified anything that snakeheads have done bad. Yeah, interesting. Not to say it hasn't happened. In how many years? But we and, well, and we're not looking at everything. To be right. fair, right? Well, we're not, we're not looking at everything. But you'd be hearing about it if it was like you all I would hear. So. 
We're, yeah. we're mining data yeah. for, that George Mason has on their trawl surveys. That's how we found out. Band of killifish numbers actually increased after Snakehead showed up. Um, and yet it's their, one of their food sources. Right. I mean, that's, yeah. How do you um, explain hmm. that? Bluegill, where people have illegally stocked snakeheads in almost every lake in my work area. I, I we Mike Eisen and I manage... 25 lakes i think in our work area 10 county 12 counties um and and i think there's only two left they don't have snakeheads sleeters what's that is sleeters in, in your area sleeter is in my area and that one does not have snakeheads i know about yeah okay. That's, that is a great yeah. place to fish too um for bass and crappie but uh but snakeheads were put illegally in burke and brittle mm -hmm. two lakes that we own these, these are public fishing lakes owned by dwr those were those were two of the earliest stock lakes in fact we we I don't know, I probably said last time I was here, we, we arrested and prosecuted the kid that stocked him in Brittle. Only only conviction we have in the state about somebody illegally stocking snake kids. Dang. But what that did was they accidentally gave us an outdoor laboratory. Hmm. And Mike Ozel was the lead author on a paper we published at the uh, Snakehead Symposium where we looked at bluegill after snakeheads showed up in Burke and Brittle. And the bluegill populations weren't impacted at that point and i would argue still aren't interesting uh, so, so if we look at the two species that they're eating in the you know the highest numbers and there's not going on with those populations i think it'd be hard pressed to argue that they're impacting something else especially when we've pretty much i think proven i can I'm, i can say that i think that, that they're not doing anything with largemouth bass yeah so if, if they're not hurting the bass fishery and they're not hurting bandy killifish they're not hurting bluegill um i think where they are now we're pretty confident in saying they're not doing anything bad now Again, for Fish Chief Mike, we're still a little concerned if they get into a system where there's a threatened or endangered black banded sunfish, and then maybe there's going to be an impact there. So that that's still our caution um, as to why that we're not, you know, jumping on the bandwagon yet, like mm -hmm. all our constituents are. So we go through a regulatory mm -hmm. cycle every two years for aquatic regs. That's okay. That's Last year was we came out of one. Last year, so we solicit. Thomas, Jared can write in. Send in an email or letter, anything you want, about anything you want. Hmm. What, what do you want to see DWR do with fish? Last cycle, we got more comments about one species than any other species. I'm like, okay. You got one one guess. <laughs> Snakeheads were the number one comment what was from our consensus? constituents. What was, the con what was the general consensus? 100%. <laughs> 100%. You know, we said not, that not kill, not kill save so and wow. save. we have that on the show we talked about mm -hmm. that last time you were here and i brought this up to mike too when i love you mike by the way uh when i got his opinion when i had him down there the economic impact of this is fascinating because mm -hmm. it's if you asked a biologist i think up at the saint lawrence mm -hmm. they would say like this is absolutely devastating rightfully mm -hmm. so with the gobies and mm -hmm. stuff but the economic side is i think you saw a massive mm -hmm. tick because yes, people going absolutely there. the cult tribe Yes. Of people that want to yes. catch a dragon. Because I didn't know that. That's the, a buck is a deer. A dragon is what you call a trophy size Thanks snakehead. That's even <clears throat> a sex appeal there in the name. <laughs> people want to catch it. And I said, like, that's going to be interesting to see. And, and you're so right because people here, they're going to, you know, the St. Lawrence, like you're saying, to go after big smallmouth that in that area mm -hmm. is probably not the predominant species that they're targeting. But for this, how much money are they spending to yeah. go north to be able to catch big five, six, you know, seven pounds? And I'm not, I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong. Right. I just think it's a very interesting observation yes. that, it, well, if is 100%. this going to create a more of an economic impact in the positive? And what will that do to decision? That's what I like future? about his, like back to what you're saying. And I think through that experience, you've, you've been able to formulate your, you might even have an opinion, but what is, what does mother nature tell you once it's all, once it's done, what, what do we see the result being? Um, mm -hmm. being open-minded to that, to being open-minded, I think is probably <clears throat> maybe a good way to look at it too. I, my, I have two primary things, my job. Well, number one, conserve the resource. Number two, make fishing better. <clears throat> if, I like it. Right? That's, and if, if I like it. Usually those things go hand in hand. Right. Not always. So if, if all my constituents want snakeheads and we're still telling them they're bad and they're not doing anything <laughs> bad yet, <laughs> Are we doing a good job? <clears throat> I don't know. Thank you so much for coming on. I always love talking to Wealth you. I appreciate knowledge. it. Guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Again, please like and subscribe to the channel. Please join us on Patreon. Once we hit our goal, guys, we're going to be able to start our own nonprofit here shortly. We'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.